Okay, so on the show today, Pedro Pass. So I've been wanting to sort of bring some exposure to some people in the kind of Portuguese embodiment scene. And Pedro definitely was one that I wanted to, to talk to. Um, a, because uh, I like him. I like him a lot. Met him personally. I've danced with him. I've hung out with him a bit. And um, also, you know, he's, he's, he's a, a, one of the bigger names in the kind of Portuguese scene, I'd say. A dancer, a dance teacher. I've been involved with lots of projects there for many, many years. It looks like you're in the woods today, Pedro. So um, welcome. Oh, thank you, Mark. First, thank you for inviting me to this, which I find really interesting, especially to give this interview on the woods in the middle of uh, the Atlantic. So I'm in Azores Islands, and this is how it looks most everywhere. So I found out uh, if I could have a good network here, and in fact, I do. So I say, let's take the chance of giving this, uh, this chat call here on the, on the middle of the woods. You know, you're actually one of the few guests who's joined us from, you know, the middle of, from nature. And that's kind of surprising when you think of the embodiment world. I guess most people just don't trust their Wi-Fi. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's one thing I like about Portugal. I know you're in the Azores, which is only technically part of Portugal. Is that sort of slightly more kind of outdoorsy life? I think it goes naturally with movement and embodiment. It does, of course, because moving is nature. So it makes all the sense when you're talking about dance and movement uh, to connect with nature. Not only because I really believe in bridges between urbanity and the nature, huh? because we are humans, we need to be in human in a urban context to keep alive somehow, as we are a lot. You know, nature wouldn't stand us all at the same time. <laughs> there, we would, uh, <laughs> we would yeah. uh, just uh, fuck it all. If uh, we would be all, nature wouldn't understand the purpose of us being all together there. So we need to create these settlements, which we call cities. And uh, I think it's really important to deal with them and uh, to create a good uh, city environments to live, inspired in nature. But nature, I believe, more and more is a place for us to, to visit and to feel peaceful and to some of us engage more in the rural, rural life. But yeah, I'm a city man, in fact. And Let's hear a bit about your life, because I did I just learn that you grew up in China. I did in South China since I was What's a kid. What's the story? Tell, tell us, because you don't look Chinese. I'm guessing you 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 know you're not from there. So, so <laughs> take that. <laughs> we'll get in trouble. <laughs> um, so yeah, tell us about your life, like like China and then Portugal, and how did you get started in dance? Tell us a bit about your story. What my story. It's when I when I went to China, I was a child. I was really small, so I uh, I had the, the part of my father's family there, and then I moved to with my parents. And uh, it was for me the most beautiful thing is the contact of uh, of the Chinese culture and the Oriental culture in a time that there was no network, there was no not the spreading of information around. And suddenly there I was without knowing how and why in my classroom full of Chinese kids. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it was a big change for me there. And soon I was uh, seeing myself playing in uh, Buddhist monasteries and, uh, and temples and, uh, and having this uh, interaction with Chinese, which is totally different. I think we, we, the way we meet Chinese nowadays is not it's not the same. We have an, an idea of Chinese uh, community uh, different than uh, the real Chinese there. And I'm really grateful to have this connection with the uh, Chinese people. I had a brother that uh, was really linked. He would speak Chinese and he was presenting us and me. He was bringing me everywhere to his Chinese friends. They were speaking Chinese. I wouldn't understand anything. But I remember to have a lot of fun and they had all this smile and this very generous and uh, kind uh, way of living that inspired me a lot. Yeah, China was really a big thing for me. And then mm. I came back to, I was start studying dance there. And that's especially I start dancing by my own as a kind of lonely child because when you grow up uh, and you realize you're, you're not... Uh, the same sort of child that uh, you meet, you know, like having all this bunch of friends and going around. So I was this sort of solitary child. So diving into my own uh, music, I was playing piano, doing ballet since kid and having this uh, uh, 
very different uh, sort of education. So uh, was was interesting to to meet that in China, and uh, yeah, as a kid, so I could grow up with the with my parents' uh, Portuguese culture and uh, the Chinese culture there. So it made me a bridge inside. So between my Christian Occidental references of my parents and then there with the Buddhist Taoist realm, like wait, going to to school. I remember this for me is a very very beautiful image of. Since keep going to school and being in the bus stop beside the garden and seeing all these old people doing qigong and tai chi, for example, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. super inspiring all the time for me. I was very connected with qigong and tai chi, and the Chinese medicine and the Chinese pharmacies and herbs and all this. Uh, uh, another uh, idiosyncrasy of uh, yeah, and it it made. And when I came back to Portugal when I was uh, 16 to to continue my studies in the conservatory, I found out I was a bit of a freak, you know, because I was I was speaking Portuguese, I was a Portuguese guy, but I was different, and I didn't realize why I was mm. that different until 20 years after I returned to China, and then I realized, oh, I'm from here now. I understand, I'm from here, and uh, although I'm Portuguese, but this is my 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 roots, my background, my yeah, and that's a bit of of my origins there. How old were you when you came back to Portugal? I was 16. I was living alone okay. with 16. So it was also a big challenge. So I was in a conservatory, which was kind of a monastery. In the, you know, growing up in a conservatory, like from 8 in the morning to 8 at nine, eight at night, 12 hours a day, including Saturdays, you really live like a monk style, no? Not not too much time to hang out or to... It was really dance, 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 dance. So it's a dance yeah. school, right? For those, it might sound strange, but some of our listeners don't know the dance world. So a conservatory is a sort of traditional Western dance school, right? Yeah. It's an amazing school, our school here. But in fact, they I just heard a few years ago that with my, with my generation, they were testing the limits, the physical limits that they could go with the dance students. So they just fucked up all my body. And this was one of the reasons <laughs> that because my back couldn't stand anymore all the all the dance and the, the ballet and the big jumps and the pirouettes and all this stuff. And uh, so I dedicated myself to Qigong to heal my body. And this was a, a big change. So when I was around my 20, very early, and thankfully I start uh, early, I start having a totally different approach very soon to the somatic approach of movement. And because I was already danced, since I never stopped dancing, I started merging the Qigong Tai Chi in my dance without realizing how new that could be, especially here in Portugal. And uh, there was nothing about it. And when people knew that I was dancing with this Tai Chi quality, I was, uh, people were looking me to the side like, what, what the hell are you doing? What is these soft movements you are doing now, you know? Especially in a time that people were very rough and... Uh, it was a lot about stamina and uh, power and uh, strength and uh, jumping. And a lot of my classmates, their bodies are totally, they look like uh, 60, you know, in their, uh-huh. their knees are uh-huh. totally broken, their backs are broken. And uh, I'm kind of lucky to, to reach out 44 and being uh, healthy in my body. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, no, you're definitely, definitely in good shape. I've danced with you and you're uh, certainly healthy. Um, so you were one of the really the first people to do kind of, I guess we could call it free dance, conscious dance, postmodern dance. Like my understanding is you're really one of the pioneers of that in Portugal, right? I was in Portugal because it wasn't too open already abroad and uh, dance was already very, uh, very developed towards this somatic approach. But in Portugal, it wasn't. But I was not aware of that at all, really. It was, I was just doing my thing. This is one of my characteristics. I'm, I'm not this guy that is trying to see what, what others doing to get inspired. I, I always found kind of a place inside or with my own life in my solitude to, to find my artistic resources and my research. And I was always very curious to find it inside me. And I, I believe this is what makes, made something people found special maybe about my work. It was because of that. So with the Qigong, for example, uh, when I start uh, opening classes for outside and r- really because I needed the money eh? because in Portugal it was not easy to to make your life just with with the dance company 
I was independent with my own dance company, which I was directing. And uh, we had a lot of money from the government and this, uh, but there was a period that we didn't. And then uh, we decided, guys, we, we need to give classes. So we op our company opened classes and people were joining. And it was the first time I could see people were dancing barefoot and uh, having another sort of music environment and uh, proposals to go inside the body to meet their joints. And people weren't used to understand that they had a, they had a subtleness in their movement. They had a, an immense possibility of motion that if they would, would zoom in, they would open up a big picture about themselves and dance and the others. So this, this was something like that. And in fact, the Qigong, we did, we did a proper session. Uh, you know, um, this, the, this, this refined proper session that Qigong gives you, it expands a lot your, your perspective of dance. And yeah, that, that was my, my, my main research. And, uh, and, and also, it's it's a big world a world the, the, the Qigong, huh? and people people normally they have this uh, this idea of of uh, a lot of protocols and formulas of Tai Chi and Qigong, but mm -hmm. soon I, I was very lucky to meet uh, in China amazing masters that uh, they were having these hundreds of of students practicing this uh, sword uh, formulas or the fan formulas and all very beautiful choreographed. And I have a, a, an episode that I like sometimes to 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 talk about because it was quite funny. I was I was dancing in a garden there, but my childhood garden that I was invited to choreograph there. Lowly Nyok was called the garden, and um, and I was with my dancers and choreographing and rehearsing them. And then uh, the production uh, manager from our performance he came to me and said, Ah, Pedro, you know, there's the the Shifu, like the master, the Tai Chi master, wants to speak with you. And I said, oh, let, let's do it. So they, they brought me to him. And I just remember him with this backlight, very cinematographic uh, thing with his students. I approached him and he just told me, nice to meet you. I enjoyed your Tai Chi very much. And I said, oh, thank you. Yeah. But I wasn't practicing Tai Chi. And he said, yes, you were. And I insisted again. Uh, I was dancing. I was not practicing Tai Chi. Yes, you were. You know, okay. <laughs> if you insist, I was practicing Tai Chi. Thank you. And then he told me, "Show me your Tai Chi." This is something very characteristic in the in the in the Tai Chi world. Like when they ask you, "Show me your Tai Chi," because everyone has their own Tai Chi, and this is something that people it's, it's interesting to understand. So everyone has their own method. There, everyone has their own research. And then I show me your Tai Chi. I start, uh, I, I close my eyes and I tune into the best formulas I studied when I was young about it. No, so I was starting oh, doing something really I thought was beautiful and precise and this and that with my eyes closed. And I just heard like, ah, and, and I opened my eyes and he told me, I thought you were going to show me something better than that. <laughs> so what do you mean? And he told me, I'm going to show you some true Tai Chi. You have to come with me because I cannot do this beside my students because they'll tell me I'm crazy. And then nobody wants to come anymore to my classes. I didn't get it the first time what he meant with that. So he brought me somewhere hidden in the garden. And that guy started tuning into himself and, and his body was, was shaking and moving and start to having like the image I have was like flames and thunders coming out of his body. Such an embodied things it's beyond words I cannot really explain and myself perceiving that I felt almost embarrassed because I was not used to that to that powerful energy that was coming out of the body of that man and it was incredible you know like something we wouldn't see on the movies or something like that and uh, and he told me this is Qigong this is Tai Chi and I was Phew. and for me it was totally mind-blowing and he told me the true Qigong is improvised. The true cha uh, Tai Chi is improvised. You tune into yourself, deep into your core, and it will flow through you. And you just need to learn that and to believe that. But because in China, it was not allowed to people to be emancipated, the only way that Qigong and Tai Chi teachers were able to pass some of the information, the precious information, was through the formulas, choreographed, energetical gymnastic they will call it energetical gymnastic but they couldn't say they were doing tai chi or moving energy it 
was something soft that was good for the joints and people to keep their bodies healthy and their mind healthy, but nothing about emancipating themselves through movement. So this was really a core moment in my life when I understood that. So, ah, that's why the spontaneous Qigong is forbidden in China. And if you say you practice a spontaneous Qigong, you're, you're not going to be well seen. You know, you're going to be kind of, mm, he's a freak. So because I'm Western and I live in the Western, I wasn't afraid of that. I don't live in China anymore. So I start researching inside myself was what was all this about improvising without even knowing all the, so much about the improvisation of, of dance and um, and uh, contact improvisation, which I was practicing with my colleagues based on this uh, Qigong Tai Chi principle. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that. I'm really grateful for the most, the best part of my work to have been sort of a self-research between me and my colleagues, not going to a lot of workshops or meeting masters to teach me. It was really inside, you know, and I really believe that it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, go deep, go inside yourself, trust, take time with yourself and uh, you probably find something. It needs to, it's an act of faith, you know, when you start researching. But in my, in my case, it was, it was successful because people had started attending to my, my sessions in my classes and they found something there that, uh, uh, yeah, was good for them. And it still is. Mm-hmm. That's something fresh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you really develop the kind of dance scene in Portugal, right? Like these dance labs that you do. Um, I couldn't get to one. I was trying to. Is it Arriba, Ar- uh, Arabita? Where, where yeah, are they at? Uh, remind me that. Uh, Arabida. How do I say it? Because we say Arabida. Arabida. Arabida is the mountain in uh, in South Lisbon, which historically yeah. it came from it comes from the Arab Al Ribat. That means uh, the um, a place of contemplation, or a place of. Um, also, they, they had this double meaning of because it was high mountain, so they could see the boats and the pirates coming. So it could be the place of watching, but also spiritual wise, it was kind of the place of uh, inner perception, no? kind of something like that. So Arabida or Al Ribat was, since I was a child, my family was uh, going there to the beaches as amazing, one of the most beautiful uh, beaches in the European coast. And I was, I grew up there before I. Even when I came with in holidays, living in China, every year I was coming in the summer to Portugal. That was a place, a very special place for me. And suddenly there I am. Uh, in the we are doing the the twenty first edition. I basically started with my husband there. He's somewhere hiding there. He doesn't want to appear, but he's giving me the internet uh, <laughs> the internet he's, source. He's, I've met him. He's a beautiful man. <laughs> And a great cook, no? He was there, and I remember you telling that it was one of the best uh, catering services you got in the gathering, no? You were not in a habit, but yes. you were with uh, with me and Tom. And by the way, yeah, it, it was really amazing to see you and to meet you dance there. Because sometimes I, I remember the first time I met you, I was like, ah, how is this guy moving, you know? And in fact, you move, man. You move, you groove. You not only move, you groove. And your body just... Well, just, like- just the shapes you want and it, it's amazing yeah and, Thanks, and bottom man. Like, sometimes people know me as sorry it's a lag on the line sometimes people know me as like conference organizer or like business guy or whatever and i'm like no primarily i'm an embodiment guy i'm a mover and yeah, move sometimes right. people are surprised when they find that out you know <laughs> like no this is what i love to do you know like i was really run down the last time i saw you and i was like what do i want to do to kind of nurture myself and heal myself. I was just on the back of a trip to Ukraine and I was like dancing in the woods with Pedro and Tom and like the others, like that just seems like, uh, for me, that's my nourishing space as well. So, so it was a really beautiful, beautiful event, that one actually. So, um, yeah, we've, uh, I'll be back, back in that location actually next week, teaching my own workshop for coaches. So, um, the beautiful yeah, it's place, a really beautiful space. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's, um, there are. That's the Quinta Tenchi Center. We had Rita uh, on the podcast, actually. She's yeah. uh, who uh, runs it. 
Yeah, yeah, she's been on, on the podcast. Nice. But I mean, Arabic, is, Arabic, is that actually a community or is it a venue? Like people have been telling me, oh, I should visit, I should go there, like for various reasons I haven't got around to it yet. But is it kind of an ongoing place or is it just an event that's once a year? Like what, what, is, what is it? So Arabia itself is a natural park. Man. There's a lot of uh, oh, okay. little, little uh, communities. This is an, another, another issue I would love to talk about because people are, a lot of times think about community like people living together all the time uh, with each other and building up mm. this community i've done that for years and now i really believe that the most healthy thing is a good neighborhood so a uh, habida has this there's a lot of spots yeah. where people are settling and then they create a, a, a community which they are they are they are not they are independent and doing their own stuff and in fact one of these settlements it's a place called ser vivo which I, since its beginning, I'm connected with. Yes, yeah, friends of mine that that uh, opened that space. Uh, I met this this these guys. It's a couple with kids. Around 25 years ago, and they were doing a their clown, and they work with children in the hospitals with children mm-hmm. with cancer. So all their work was basically about that, working with children. They do beautiful work. And when I when I dropped in, they were not used to work with with adults, and I was not used to work with children. That's a fact. So I really, I really understood that my path is with adults. And has a, has a big friend of mine told me once, like, it is never too late to have a happy childhood. So as an adult, we can really work that on, like recovering and retuning with this childhood, this playground that uh, dance can can offer us. So I, I made my first retreat there. They, have, they didn't have any sort of conditions there. It was like a cement floor. And uh, the, the space was big enough. And I told them, okay, I need to build up a dance floor here, guys. To do. And, and they told me, is it really necessary? And I said, yes, a dance floor with air box so we can jump there, wood. And uh, yeah, and I did it. I waste all my, my, my financial resource building that. So it was really an investment in the beginning. And, uh, and it started like that. This was in 2016. And I never stopped. It became my second home where I kept developing my retreats and little gatherings. And until nowadays, the, the space evolved, evolved, evolved. And uh, everyone that is now living came because of my retreats. And they, 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 they acknowledge that. And they tell me that. So all these people that are living you know, here, every gathering we do, someone stays. And then, uh, and now they have a beautiful core group that is that is a, a sort of familiar environment, and they're yeah, they're doing it really well, really well. So Servivo is a small place. It's a very humble place. It's not a, it's not a fancy retreat place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, there are other fancy retreat places, and a lot of people and organizers tell me, Pedro, why are you keeping Servi with such a poor place to to do the quality of your work? And and uh, I feel it's a kind of um, fidelity. I would say that. Uh, mm-hmm. it, the, yeah, yeah, it's my, yeah, it's my place. You know, it's not that that uh, big or fancy, or because there is really other places amazing that have another resources but it's like it's it's my place and i really enjoy doing and that and there's a memory there already with our work and we go in in our yeah, yeah. yeah so that's a bit of I'm interested, in this, like, I'm interested in this idea of community and neighborhoods you know i think i'm with you on this i've i've been to places that there are like live-in communities where you know like findhorn for example in scotland you know wonderful places but they're very intense and there's a lot of, there has to be a lot of discussion and a lot of kind of local politics and, you know, and then there's other places that are just cool towns or even I'd say, you know, Portugal kind of becoming like cool country places that it could be a city, it could be a region, it could even be a nation that just kind of attracts people who have a certain vibe or interested in a certain thing. And, you know, I know this in the, um, I don't know, the Colares area, you know, around Sintra, there's just a lot of cool people doing interesting things you know and I'm, I'm wondering if this is kind of a model for the future particularly as people like to be mobile like I didn't know you'd be in the Azores today you know like you've talked to me in different places over the years I'm like, oh, I've just got back from here I've just spent winter there and um and not everyone's a digital nomad and some people have kids and they need to be in one place for a while or 10 years or something but 
there seems more possibility to move around. And this kind of attraction of going where your values are rather than necessarily the country or place you happen to grow up in. So, um, yeah, any thoughts on this sort of slightly nomadic living and the idea of, sort of extended community? A lot. Actually, most of my thoughts were all around that, that, that theme. Since uh, 2010, I start, uh, I, start, I just I had a, a breakdown, really a burnout, I would say. And uh, I just uh, left everything back and put my, my, my bag on my back. And I uh, just left with no money and nothing. It was one of the, the, the strongest experiences of my life. And there I have the, had the opportunity throughout my, my journey to meet a lot of what these, they call these communities, you know. And, uh, but now just, just coming to a synthesis, not, not to talk about that because uh, it's, it's just uh, a lot of different experiences. One of the important things for me was there was a lot of conflicts you know, and difficult uh, things to deal with. Mm. And I was always bringing dance and people were always saying, wow, through dance, we solve so much conflict. You know, there's so much shit that we don't need, we don't need to talk about because it's, we, we tap into a place of um, a mutual understanding that we really let go a lot of these questions and, and doubts and, uh, and political considerations. And some, this was something very important for me. And it was a gift for me to understand how important dance and art and music were for the, for the cohesion of, of communities or little tribes or little clans, whatever you want to call them. And, uh, and it, it happened that I, I found the perfect community. I thought it, this was 2016. It was in the north of, um, it was in Galicia. And uh, there was, they were one of, they are one of the oldest communities in Europe. The, their project is amazing. It's about reforesting since the early 80s. And they are there. And I was totally like, finally, I arrived to the place I was dreaming about and this and that. And when I was there settling, I got a phone call from my family saying that my mother had a stroke. So I was the only one close to her as everybody, every, all my brothers were out. So I simply had to take all my stuff and come back to Portugal. And my mom, she lives in uh, one of the most problematic neighborhoods in Lisbon you know, from uh, with African and gypsy people. So it was really a place, a very dense place and. Uh, and there I was suddenly after being in this paradise, in this neighborhood, yeah. in my childhood, uh, uh, my early childhood uh, bedroom, full of memories and boxes of stuff, you know, and with my mom totally paralyzed uh, with, uh, with 80 years. And I needed to, to, you know, to clean her, to change her, her, her clothes, giving her bath, uh, all this. And suddenly... I realized that life for somehow it was bringing me this, this chance for me to understand something, you know, and I understood I was running away a lot of, oh, I was running a lot away. It took me time to understand this. And suddenly what I realized is that in this crazy neighborhood, I met the most generous people, the most um, loyal, loyal people, uh, <laughs> Uh, warm-hearted, uh, truthful, and it was a, an incredible, uh, it was totally mind-blowing. After all these years in art and this uh, new age thing and going around and suddenly that was in Lisbon, meeting, uh, you know, uh, totally, it was not a new reality. It was just confronting myself to something that it was always there and that I was, uh, wow, meeting back my family and... Uh, it was an amazing step. Oh, yeah. so I, the alchemist story, isn't it? You know, it's under our nose the whole time. We go to these exotic communities in Bali or Thailand. It will go around <laughs> the world. And, you know, sometimes it's just right there. It's right there. But it's fine. It's fine, Mark. You know, more and more, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong. You know, if you choose to go to Bali, go to Bali. If you choose to, to live in New York, live in New York. If you choose to be a, a poor monk barefoot, be a poor monk barefoot. If you want to be rich, be rich. You know, if you want to be a bitch, be a bitch. If you want to be a saint, be a saint, whatever, you know, and there's, there's a time, you know, for us to experience all this diversity. And, and I, I think one of the good things in me, I was, I was never scared kind of to, 
to 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 move around all my, all my my diversity and since i i came back to the city and i needed to make money here you know so because living in the city is not the same like living in a community where you grow your stuff and you don't need money you need but mm -hmm. There's an, another flow of um, resources and things. And in Lisbon, I start teaching again in Lisbon since that time. Then I start doing the retreats. And thankfully, all my great income starts coming from there. And I, I say it's, I was very lucky to, to I, I exclusively dedicate my life for dance, nothing else. And I can live uh, properly with that. And it, and then I realized, oh my God! So I, I step out of this this uh, new age communities to meet people here, and work with them with the, with the urban reality. And the first thing I start uh, seeing was like, I had like old people coming to my classes and young people, like uh, 18, 20 year old dancers, for example. And um, I remember a woman that she's still my friend nowadays. She's, she was 72 by that time. And after a couple of months, she offered me a book. She wrote uh, handwrite with some pictures that she took in a retreat. I did my first retreat, I think. And then at the end, she said, thank you for, uh, for helping me to awake again and to get out of a depression I didn't even realize I was. And she was not the first person telling me that. A lot of people were telling me that. Dance is taking me out of this uh, gray zone of this depression, of this um, sadness, mm -hmm. uh, of this anger, of whatever. And uh, so more and more I start believing, okay, I'm in the right path. So I'm living here close by to the city, even in Arabida. I try to live in the countryside with Ugo, uh, but as close as I can to the cities because it's where is the, the concentrated mass of my, um, of the public that, that can really enjoy of my work. So I, I don't feel like now, to work with the uh, with the uh, barefoot hippies only, you know that uh, they come and uh, enjoy a lot, you know the dance and the ecstatic dances and this this doesn't interest me anymore that much. <laughs> Although I can have a lot of fun sometimes, but I really want to work with people that sometimes are scared to step into the studio, and and yeah, yeah. the diver you sh for sure you have the same, but that diversity of people that come to you, and you don't know how. Uh, mouth to mouth because I'm not a great promoter of my work but I see people that for example an astronaut I had an astronaut coming to my work doctors uh, lawyers architects uh, people that had the most weird uh, jobs and then there they are and they come totally stiff and, uh, and not knowing what where, where they're going and at a couple of hours after, they already feel safe. And uh, this is something that is a quality I know of, of the, my work is that people say they feel safe. They feel they're in a trustful uh, environment and they, they know they're, they're held. And this is, I, I have no recipe for that, it's my nature, but this is something I know that people talk about. So they come because they know it's, it's trustful somehow. And then they start allowing and allowing. And when they find themselves rolling on the ground, and laughing again and touching each other, touching themselves, touching other bodies and, and feeling this, uh, this connection, synchronicities, playfulness, joy, a joy, a certain type of joy that it's not the one that, uh, you know, we used to have only when we drink or when you go out and have some fun with our, with, with our friends. It's, it's another sort of joy that you meet by setting your body free and playing with others it's yeah it's incredible it's it's i'm so happy honestly <laughs> to have find this to find this path of of embodiment and dance really i'm so I'm really a lucky guy yeah yeah it's a privilege to be able to, to be able to do this work for sure and you know this i guess the scene has changed quite a lot in portugal um as one of the sort of ogs you know the original gangsters of the uh, Portuguese embodiment world in the, a lot of teachers have moved there, you know, um, I've got some friends who are from Russia or different places who have moved there. Um, you know, the retreat of yours I went on was pretty international, I guess like 50% non-Portuguese maybe. Um, obviously people coming to communities, people just coming to, to be digital nomads, you know, that's a huge thing. Portugal's kind of cool which is kind of a weird thing to say about a country. 
like one of my friends said, why is everyone moving to Portugal? You know, like, like, what are your thoughts on this sort of, uh, sometimes I call it a movimento, this kind of like a gathering, this kind of uh, movement of different people to Portugal? Yeah, it's called the little India, you know, kind of, there was this, this exodus to India in a certain period in the 60s or 70s. And uh, Portugal is, it became Bali also, but Portugal is easy as an, an European country with such a beautiful mm-hmm. light and coast. But this is a superficial part, but I, if I, I would tell you something that it's maybe, you know, my own belief of, but we have, we have uh, not going too much into spirituality really, but it's a fact that we cannot turn around. There is a, a, a tradition in Portugal that actually is very alive here in Açores. It's the tradition of the Holy Spirit. And when you talk about that, it's not, it's really beyond the religiosity and all this. Huh? It's, it's something very powerful and you can still feel this here. And Portugal has this Holy Spirit tradition. And the Holy Spirit, it's something that it's beyond religion. Eh? It's, it's like a life power, uh, the, the supreme good that you can imagine of uh, bliss that uh, Portugal in its prophecy, it said that it will be the land where that will, will, will blossom again. When the world will be in a dark age, Portugal would be an epicenter of that. But not Portugal, the frontiers that the political geographic frontiers of Portugal that we know of. It's something that it's called Lusitania. And Lusitania was a nomad people. It's called people of light, the Lusitans. And they were nomadics. It's all these lands. They didn't have boundaries or frontiers. They would move around here. And uh, so they, they, the Romans, when they conquered uh, this region, they said, these guys don't rule themselves and don't let themselves be ruled. So this is a, a very classical thing about the Lusitans. They don't, they don't rule themselves and they don't allow no one to rule them. They were free people. They were uh, uh, very connected to, to the lands they were living. They would celebrate a lot of togetherness, circles. Their houses were round-shaped. So there's a lot of things like... Uh, that to, and we're talking about a thousand years. Eh? So even when, when the Christianity is settled here in this region, this, um, this uh, Lusitanian background was always here. And we, when we say, um, for example, uh, a, a relation between uh, America and Portugal, we don't, we don't say Portuguese-American relation. We say Luso-American relationships. Luso is always the word connected to Portuguese, Luso. And Luso is originally something about light. So these Luz Italian lands were always kind of um, um, a place of a lot of hope. And, uh, but not only now, huh? it, since the, the 19th century, the first naturist communities were already settling here in Alentejo, in Odmira, where, uh, for example, Muji is, where Tamera is, all this region, mm-hmm. for a long mm-hmm. time has already been kind of a place that was summoning people there. So people were finding uh, like um, um, a fertile soil for, for developing kind of uh, humanity, recovering a kind of humanity that was being lost. So Portugal has this mist around it, you know, and people are coming here. We don't need, now, now I really don't believe we need to think about this, you know, and, and going to, to, to speculate about these spiritual things. I just, I just believe we need to be the way we are. And all these prophecies were just for us to arrive now and be who we are in the moment, truthful and, and playful and as joyful as we can, even with all this craziness, these adversities. And man, you know, I really believe it. And I know your story and, I, and it really touched me when you were there, you know, this amazing moment, that shift that created the shift in our, in our retreat that you were. I think you remember, you know, with this Russian woman. The first night, yeah, I came and I had like a lot of pain. And I think I told this story once on the podcast that I really had this like hate in my heart towards Russians from, you know, obviously hearing a lot of bad stories in Ukraine and being around all the suffering. And it was like a seed in me that was really making me sick, you know? And yeah. on the first night of the dance, just got there. I hadn't even done the opening circle yet. Just dance before you talk. Great way to do it. I was dancing with everyone and this one very beautiful girl and we're 
just had a great chemistry and we're dancing together and I'm so pleased to meet her and I'm like wow I'm gonna make some great friends here this is a great place and just opening up and then we go around the circle and I'm sitting next to you and it goes around the other way so the last two people to share her and me and yep. she introduces herself and she's Russian and I had no idea I know and I just immediately burst into tears because I'd said to myself look if there's any Russians there I'm not going to dance with them you know fine I'll be civil but I'm not gonna and then it was just I just cracked open cried in front of this whole group which is not like me I'm not like the guy who's crying all the time and um (laughs) but I'm not doing this every two minutes you know and I just cracked open and then it's sort of I think you know maybe deepened straight away like this dance thing and that's the magic of magic of Portugal, the magic of Quintetanchi, the magic of your work and of dance more broadly, that it creates those healings and those moments that don't, that are sort of synchronistic, synchronistic, synchronistic like that. that. That specific moment, Mark, you know, it just, and this is something else because sometimes with dance, we're searching for the joyful moments, for having fun. <laughs> and this is something that I realized, especially when you go to contact retreats and to dance retreats or ecstatic People are aiming to feel this ecstatic feeling of joy, of playfulness. And uh, one, one thing I've learned, thankfully, uh, I believe, maybe it's because of my nature, is that there is no true joy if it's not grounded in the, your honest sadness and pain. We cannot ex- escape from it, you know. This would give us another, another podcast about it. But the fact is really to, uh, to go deep, for your joy to really be deep, it needs to be grounded in, 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 in the pain. And I would say the pain is not necessarily the, 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 the pain that we are kind of um, philosophically used to, to connect with. But it's something that it's, it's, uh, it's very strong. And you brought that with that honest moment because we all have our own pains. And that specific moment, you just drop it and you cried and you open up your heart and she cried. And afterwards, the whole week or the, the next days, you were always together dancing and you both had so much fun all the time. You were dancing beautifully. You and Paulina, I have to say her name, because she's a beautiful dancer. You were both dancing amazingly for, you, for me. You both were a reference in that, in that gathering because you overcame something. You tapped into that pain you embody it, you were not afraid, you were not escaping of it, and you danced it. And there was a tremendous joy, happiness, and, and realization grounded in that, you know. It's, and this is something very important. It was interesting, yeah. 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 It was for like two days, we like didn't let each other go. And every time we tried to find a new partner, we were the only people without a partner. <laughs> and then after that, it was, and we thought, oh, maybe something romantic is going to happen here. And then, and then after two days, it was just gone. You know, it was like, it was done. And we're still cool. Like I texted her the other day and like, um, you know, we're friends, you know, but it's like, um, it was interesting. It was like two days and then of joy. And then it was cool. It was just dissipated. It like worked through somehow, you know? And I, and I think this is, this is dance. And I think also Portugal does seem to create these magic moments. You know, there's something going on there. I'm not a big mystical guy, but there's something going on there in that place, you know, the Sintra area and Portugal more broadly. And I, I can see why it attracts people who are drawn to something. I, you know, I would kind of sort of say to listeners that I don't, I don't want to like paint Portugal like paradise or something, you know, and no, I think it's also all. really, you know, also it's really important to be respectful to people who are established there like you, which I've always tried to do. And I, you know, I love your classes, so that's not hard. And, um, you know, I think there's a way in which people can come to these magic places and not engage locally not learn a language, not connect. And I, and I think Portugal is more chance of connecting because it's less foreign in a way, you know, like just very practically, I can go to Portugal and I can fly home to see my parents or something, right? And it's a European country. And there's that, um, you know, there's enough shared culture there. Though I, though I have heard this is happening, say in Thailand now, my friend who runs a contact retreat in Thailand said there's more Thai people coming to these things now. Um, you know, as kind of Eastern countries get more Westernized in a way, though those, you know, more people speak English. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's some important points there that not to paint any place as this Shangri-La across the sea where everything will be fine because, you know, I've spent enough time in Portugal now that I've kind of seen the other side of it too and things that aren't great and there's problems and, and you know, realize like, oh, I've got to tread a bit respectfully here and not just barge into things sometimes. So there's, there's, a, there's a learning there for me as well. 
yeah mark i believe that you know in this in this uh I, I, the only the only word that comes for me new age this new age um, movement that is sometimes uh, driving people it's it's uh, what we say a sword with two two points you, you have that expression yeah yeah double edged sword yeah <laughs> yeah so. because i've been there also and it was quite important for me to to just get out of this to to allow myself to experience a certain paradise feeling but then there is a moment that you need to come back and to mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something like this. And Portugal is not a paradise at all. You know, it's burning everywhere. And politically, it's a mess. And uh, But wherever you choose to settle, it's really, I believe it's, it, it, it's urgent to, to, to find a way to connect with, with the locals, with the land and the locals somehow. I'm not the best people yeah. doing this. Yeah. Because I, when I, I know yeah. that yeah. I don't go... For example, if I go to the municipal of Palmela, which is the one that rules the, the region where I do my retreats, I don't feel I have a, a direct work with the community, the local community. And this is something that it's like, why, man? Maybe if I open there some classes to the people, you know? This is something I've been, been thinking about. Because I've, it's, it's really fulfilling in these gatherings to work with people that um, also bring you a lot of... Um, inspiration and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and to to start working with i did that in my early years i'm working with kids in the schools with old people in the community this was where i began be, began my work actually and i want to go back there to really bring this work to the locals in the storage for example yeah. Yeah. when i do workshops here it's with the local people there are no dancers here so i i, I meet old women okay. And yeah, and then they are all rolling in the ground and touching each other's and, and doing some Qigong exercises and, and improvising. And it's mind blowing for them. So in fact, people are really available anywhere to do a work that we think is exclusively from new age uh, atmosphere and whatever, but it's not. Actually the work, this embodiment work we are, we are developing is much more accessible to, to, to everyone. It's maybe the way you, you, you approach it to people, but it's real accessible. Yeah, and it's I, all about the approach. Like I saw, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. As I was saying, I, I saw in Ukraine, for example, because we were doing embodied work under the umbrella of trauma work, just everyone does it. It's not like, it's not a big deal because people have this motivation, they have this way in, you know, they understand that they need to work with stress and trauma and things given the situation. Like, we, you know, doctors, nurses, just just regular people, nuns, you know, like I'm a yeah. friend of the nuns at Eve now. Like this convert have adopted me. Every time I go there, they feed me pizza. And it's yeah. um, it's just because they, they had a reason, like I didn't seem too weird to them and then there was no problem. And I sometimes think we limit ourselves to this kind of more new age vibe when it, when it isn't always necessary. Yeah, I think this new age vibe is uh, it's just a concept we did, you know. It's it's the willingness we have to tap into something truthful and human. And, yeah. it, and it's also it, fun to roll around with the hippies. I like that too. <laughs> I went through a stage of hating it. Now I embrace it. I like it. <laughs> uh, no, okay, man, we need to wrap up. Yeah, I'm not I'm not in, in so that good. now because I'm not in that now. But and I really I realized that it's uh, it's maybe periods because I was so often that I got a bit yeah. uh, tired of that you know and I love yeah I know what you mean yeah. love all this this yeah. hippie atmosphere uh -huh. now how I'm yeah I'm enjoying a lot I totally changed uh, has I allow myself to change you know for example I'm here with a great uh, hangover of spending a whole weekend without sleeping and drinking until I fall, you know? And this is really not hippie <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, like fun. I'm glad you're enjoying the exhaust, Pedro. Pedro, where do people find you online? Like, like, like you're not that easy to look at, like some of your videos are on YouTube, on Facebook. Like, what's the best place for people to, to look you up? Honestly, it's uh, when I publish my stuff. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm preparing now uh, my my regular PDF about the Arabidas that we are launching in a couple of days. 
and uh, and yeah, and I think maybe uh, I don't have I have some videos in my Facebook uh, page, uh, some stuff. Not and you're on Instagram as well. Yeah, I'm not a self promoter. Pedro Paz underscore movie. Yeah, Dutch. I don't. Promote <laughs> you're not. I want to promote yeah. you though. <laughs> <laughs> you want to promote me? <laughs> I'll be thankful. <laughs> I want to share your stuff, you know, like I feel like more people should know about you, you know, where this is the problem. I mean, you know, it's difficult to get like non-American guests on this podcast because American guests will put themselves forward and good for them, not criticizing them. Maybe British ones, maybe Israeli ones. And then the rest of the world, there's all these like hidden gems like you, <laughs> just as good if not better than most of the young american teachers and i'm like come on people need to be able to find you <laughs> no, you, you just said no it's I, I i know i'm not really not a good promoter i do my work and maybe because it, it it's you yeah. can't imagine how many people just came to me saying i want to sell you i want to promote you i want to do this and, and then it's 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 hard for me to commit with that because I'm I'm entertained with my life, you know. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get want... it. I get it. You know what? <laughs> and then people arrive to my retreats in my classes, and I'm happy with that. But this is very Portuguese. Yeah, you've got a life. You've got enough people. You know, I put I a lot of life. energy. I have I've I have my family, my stuff. You know, Mark, and yeah. and I don't. Have the, I'm not. Uh, uh, maybe I don't have this ambition of becoming. And a lot of people say, Pedro, you could be a superstar in this." Uh, this and people tell me there's so much people famous, and then your work it's, you know, it's far beyond blah blah blah. And I, I remember once I came to a, one of my teachers, because it, there is something that uh, that that for me was when it was also mind shifting about the work I was doing is when my teachers were start to attending my classes. You know, like Howard Son and Claire, for example, which is a reference. You should make a podcast with Howard Son and Claire. With the, it's the yeah, first yeah, right podcast. Yeah. And, and he starts attending to my, my classes and also other teachers coming. And sometimes I have phone calls of veteran teachers, you know, uh, congratulating my, 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 my work and, and saying, Pedro, you're doing an amazing job in this and that. And I'm thankful. And, and once I, one of my teachers, I was telling her, you know, do you recommend me a school? I would really love to go deep, you know, in this, uh, in, in, in all this about the body and embodiment and this. And she said, yes, yes, yes. There is in Switzerland, one of the best, I forgot the name of the school, one of the best, best schools of embodiment, that, that, that. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I would love to go and study there. And she said, no, Pedro, I will propose you as a teacher there. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> was, I was like, I was, but I'm searching for schools. No, Pedro, forget schools. You don't need schools. You need to keep practicing. You're, you're, you're a self school. You practice, practice, and you become your school. Stop, stop with this idea that you have to learn with something. Just do it, and you learn with the people you face. You learn with your, with the people that come. Yep, learn through doing it that way. I do, have to do, say, I'm sorry, jealous. I like, I, I burnt way too much energy with marketing and. Um, promoting and like got caught in the trap of wanting to be a somebody and be known and actually it's really pretty toxic is what I've learned and um, I think the position you're in of having a following and doing your workshops and having a nice life from it and being out of travel and teaching cool students it's it's really ideal it's really ideal and I, I you know I, so I, I I've, I've had it beaten out of me like the last two years that uh, want more exposure or more anything else beat it out of me so uh, quite life is, in the woods but I admire so much you what you the way you work all your methodology and say my god I have to learn with this guy look how he presents his work look how organized he is. <laughs> look the quality of the presentation of his stuff you know I'm always like <laughs> <laughs> and then you're telling me that no no that was that wasn't me it wasn't me i particularly my second book everybody goes it's so organized and i said that was Maud Maud Haber from france who organized it for me but uh i should credit to Maud. listen i need to go unfortunately is i've got a less enjoyable meeting than this plan as ever so pedro i adore you you're gorgeous um any lovely to see you i'm sure i'll see you again i'm not sure if you're around you next week are you back in portugal or are you still there Friday, I'm back in Portugal with Hugo, and then we're preparing our uh, Habi, the 21, 21st edition, and uh, which is going to be something amazing, and I'm super, super excited with it. And this is, again, you know... Well, it, I'll give so, you a shout then. Yeah, it's when, when we're preparing our stuff, you know, meeting the teachers, talking with them, you know, like, what we're going to do, and this, that, so I'm excited with that. And yeah, this is my life. 
and I'm going back home well, soon. Enjoy. Hope a total pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'll good. give you a text after this to see if we can set up dinner or something. So nice to see you, sir. Real Bye. pleasure. Obrigado. Obrigado, you too. Huh? Thank you.